continue our study in uh, 1 Corinthians. We're getting close to the end. I know it's been a long study, but uh, we're getting close to the end. And uh, Denea <laughs> asked me yesterday what I was preaching on. And I said, where Paul says, for women to be silent in the church. <laughs> it's there. we got to cover it. <laughs> So let's read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26 through 40 says, and by the way, she said, well, I think I'm going to do nursery tomorrow. <laughs> she said, how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, that all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. But they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is shameful for women to speak in church. Or did the word of God come originally from you, or was it only you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Let's pray. Father, we come to you giving you thanks and praise for this day that, that we get to gather together in, in worship, seeking to honor you and bless you, Lord, with our hearts, lifting up our voices and song and coming together in prayer and just rejoicing in your presence, Lord. And we know, Father, that as far as the, the church is concerned, that this has been going on for 2,000 years. And, of course, even longer when we consider uh, Israel, Lord, and, and their worship of you. And so, Lord, we, we pray that, that as we are gathered here today before you, that, Lord, that we would uh, experience your presence among us. And, God, we are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture, Lord, and we love you and, and want to know you and grow in you. And, Lord, your word has tough things to say. And I pray that you give us understanding and wisdom and giving the sense, the proper sense, of what Paul intended and what uh, Timothy, I mean, uh, uh, Peter might intend or in any of the books, Lord, that, that you have given us, Lord. What is it that you are saying to us and help us to understand it appropriately, Lord? And I pray that, that you would give us that wisdom today as we cover this text that is so controversial, Lord, uh, when it really shouldn't be, Father. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, before I say that, I, I want to uh, just ask you all to uh, be lifting us up in prayer. Uh, we've been through a lot, you know, traveling to go to uh, Linda's memorial service and just a lot of other things going on. Some of you don't know that my, my best friend has... Uh, basically decided that that biblical christianity is no longer for him he's gone off into uh, a different branch i don't want to get into the details but but one that i came out of <laughs> and uh and so uh and and you may know in past when my, my friend paul ended up off the deep end too and so it, it, the four guys that i went into ministry with um you know doing apologetics only brian and myself are still uh what I would consider solid in the faith. And so uh, it's, it's been trying time for us, and, and uh, <laughs> I don't want to get emotional. Uh, me and Danae have been talking about emotions and, and, and how kind of it's kind of crazy that we would suppress them, so maybe I should let it, let it happen. But anyways, um, the idea, you know, is that, that we're, we're struggling in some areas that we haven't struggled before, and so just be, be lifting us up in prayer if you don't mind. And... Uh, and that brings to my mind, um, you know, the struggles that y'all are going through, the things that you're struggling with, that you're battling, and a lot of our health issues. And, you know, we have uh, uh, a history here of, of, of anointing with oil and praying for people. 
And, um, and, and it just occurs to me that we forget to do it sometimes or people forget to ask. And so I've really been thinking a lot about how we could develop our communion service. And, and I, just, this is going to answer a lot of the things I've been struggling with, but I think we're going to start focusing on some different things on our first Sunday of the month. Rather than doing our series that, you know, just going through our series, we're going we're gonna to focus on some specific things, maybe one-off sermon, that kind of stuff. Uh, but also we're going we're gonna to make it, I think, a regular thing to have that opportunity when we do the Lord's Supper for you to come forward and, and get anointed with oil for healing. Uh, the Bible tells us to, to, to anoint and pray over folks as elders of the church, so I, I want to make that more available to you and maybe do some other things uh, in, the, in the Lord's Supper service that, that will help us to grow as a church and, and grow in our walk. But, uh, but I, I want to be mindful of the struggles that y'all have, and sometimes when I'm in a series, I'm just locked in on the text, and I don't think in terms of what's really going on with you. And I want to I want to back away from that and not get up not give up the verse by verse teaching, but at least on on first Sundays of the month or Sundays that we do the Lord's Supper, try to take a moment for us to to stop and think about that. And as we do this text today, we're going to talk about a little bit some other things we might do. But I don't want to get ahead of myself on the text because the text is really interesting today. Okay, now in our last study we saw that Paul offered love and edification as the corrective to the abuse of the gift of tongues uh, that some in Corinth were actually engaged in. And they looked at the gift as signifying spiritual eliteness. But Paul viewed it as just one of many spiritual gifts and, and really one of lesser importance. And in fact, Paul made the case that not only was the practice of the gift of tongues in the assembly without interpretation... And in my opinion, and he made the case that it's an inherently unloving act because it excludes, it cuts off the, those who, who can't understand when it's not interpreted. It's also a misguided application of the gift in the first place, which was meant as a sign of judgment on hardened Israelites who had crucified Jesus. So I, I think that Paul has really given us some insight on the nature of tongues and what it's really all about. And he wanted the Corinthians to give up their childish understanding of the gift and embrace a mature view that exalted prophecy as the greater gift because of its ability to edify those who heard it. Now in our text today, Paul wraps up, wraps up his whole discussion on spiritual gifts and the overall theme of order versus disorder in the assembly, although those, those things kind of continue a little bit, but, but the, the, the major thrust is, is uh, in this passage is him wrapping all that up. So let's go ahead then and look at verses 26 to 33 and see uh, Paul's guidance on participation in the assembly. And he says, how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation? Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or three, uh, two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another one who sits by, let the first keep silent. But you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author, author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So notice the, the, the guidance here on how each can participate in the assembly. Does that sound a little different to y'all than what we do? When you read that text, does it sound a little bit different? It sounds a little different to me. Uh, I, I, I notice the, the, that free participation in this scenario. Uh, it, this appears quite acceptable to Paul that each has this that they're bringing to the, the, the service, to the, to the assembly, to the congregation. I think it stands in, in stark contrast to most of what the church has practiced over the centuries. From early on, the church went into a more scripted service which is basically kind of what we do today. 
and we're just following a long tradition. But uh, in the early church, it seems to me that it, looked a little, it looks a little bit different than that. And in fact, I think there's been a decided tendency to control what goes on during the assembly, possibly with good reason. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can tell you about a, a friend of mine who went to a church and and it was a very more, it is more open and free and, and, and participatory. And, and one lady suddenly started uh, dancing down the aisle saying, look, God is dancing with me. Look at him. You can see him. And, and so, uh, you know, it can get out of hand. <laughs> if you just open the doors wide open to, to anything, you'll get anything. But on the other hand, should it be so scripted? Is, is that what's going on in this text? I don't think so. Uh, you know, so there is a, a, a reason why you want control or, or order, but there's also in this text this, this openness to participation. So Paul imposes some restrictions to help alleviate spiritual abuse that was going on in Corinth and the, the, the disorder that seemed to be uh, occurring in their assemblies. And of course, as Lowry notes, he says the controlling principle in this free participation was the rule of love. So anybody acting in an unloving way in the church towards others, like speaking in tongues without it being interpreted, uh, if they were doing that, that's unloving. Or ex exalting themselves as some spiritual elite, that's unloving. Uh, anyone acting in, this, uh, in an unloving way obviously is out of bounds. So the main controlling principle is love. But Paul gives some practical limitations that, uh, to the assembly that, that work to maintain order in the, in, in, the, in the assembly. Now, before we look at them, uh, I want to encourage us to consider that this is the biblical model for participation in the assembly. And, and we really need to consider how this should look at Alvin Bible Church. You know, taking into consideration all the biblical principles that apply, we, we really need to think about this. It's something I've thought about for a long time. I've just never been able to really conceptualize how it would be different. But I've thought about this for a long time. Now, Paul accepts the, the notion that there will be uh, open participation by the congregation, but, of course, he's going to set these limitations. And notice what he, what he points to. He points to two gifts, tongues and prophecy. Why? Because those are the, the issues. Those are the issues at hand. The tongues were being abused. There's a greater gift that needs to be exalted uh, over tongues, and so he's going to deal with them. That doesn't mean that there weren't other gifts being used in that assembly. There certainly were. So what does he say about tongues? He says, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, the most. He limits it. Each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. So the gift is limited by what? Number, order, each in turn, so they're not doing it all at the same time, and the presence of an interpreter. These limitations are necessary to prevent disorder in the assembly. As Kiampa and Rosner explain, by these restrictions, the scene imagined in verse 23, i.e. A, ro a room of babbling believers, is excluded. So you don't have the chaos going on uh, and everybody speaking at once and stuff. If you follow this mandate, you won't have that. You'll have order. If no interpreter is available, one with the gift of tongues is to do what? Keep silent in the assembly. Hold on to that thought. Keep that word in your mind. The concession is to speak to himself and to God. And this probably means doing so at home. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty two, 22, Paul said, What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? I shall, shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So he was correcting them uh, uh, about their activities in the Lord's Supper and how they were treating it. And he says, go home and do that kind of stuff. Paul's probably saying the same thing here. If you want to speak in tongues and there's no one to interpret, go home and do it. It's okay. It's a, it's a gift, and it'll edify you at home, and you'll be blessed, but just go home and do it, unless there's an interpreter. Notice now the restrictions on prophets. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, 
that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Now, the prophets are given the same limitation in number and in order, one by one. But rather than needing an interpreter, the prophets are to be subject to what? Judgment. Let the others judge. Now, whether the others are the other prophets or the other congregation is not really clear in the text. But I will say this, in, in, uh, uh, um, or I should say that Kiampa and, Ro- Kiampa and Rosner say this. They say in verse 37, Paul invites any who think they are prophets or otherwise gifted by the Spirit to weigh the authority of his own teaching. So he invites the whole congregation, anybody in there that thinks they're a prophet or spiritual or whatever, to weigh his authority, weigh his teaching. So probably Paul is setting that up as the, the prophets are to be judged as the whole congregation. In fact, listen to how Paul encourages the congregation in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 through 22. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace. Now, now notice that, brethren, those who are over you. He's talking to the congregation, right? And so you, did you catch that? Uh, and so... Uh, be at peace among yourselves. Now, ex- now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. This is the whole congregation. Comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, listen, do not quench the spirit. Now, In other words, if the Spirit moves, don't quench that. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So test everything. He's telling the congregation of this. Now, we're going to return to this point in a minute, but notice the final limitation on the prophet. What is it? If someone else has a revelation, what is the prophet to do? Sit down in silence. So just as with the tongue speaker, the prophet is to be silent if someone else has a revelation. Now, in this case, it's, it's due to that uh, uh, revelation and, and from a different prophet. And so whoever's turn it is has to recognize that, that someone wants to speak and has to recognize that, the, the, that they've got a revelation. Presumably... That person would just, in, in this kind of the imagination of scholars, how do you figure this out? What, how would they know? Probably they would stand up, signifying that, that they would like to speak. And so the one standing, because that's usually how it was done, that, that speakers would stand and, and, and the audience would sit, and, and so, just like us, and so uh, one, somebody would stand up, then that prophet would understand that they have something that they want to say, uh, and he would yield the floor. Now, Think about that. That's a spontaneous thing going on. The other person has their turn. They're probably not speaking spontaneously. In other words, it's probably a prepared lesson, a prepared message. This, th- th- we can really get this wrong if we think that spontaneity equals spirituality. That just because someone spontaneously feels like they should say something or feel something or do something, that doesn't mean it's the Spirit of God. And even if it is, we'll see in a second that that's controllable. Uh, Studying a a message, you know, pastors sit in their office and pour over God's Word, that's one of the most spiritual things you can do because you're being guided by the Spirit in your studies to understand and seek, and you prepare a message. (coughs) Excuse me. It's quite like Paul's writing uh, of the scriptures. God used his personality. God used everything about him to bring his word into existence as a written form. Uh, But it wasn't necessarily spontaneous. When you read 1 Corinthians and you understand it, it's a very complex, well-written, crafted message in response to something that May not even been well written. You know, remember Paul's first letter. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> so he might have hastily threw something together and sent it off to him. 
And so now, you know, he sits down and he answers them. And, and we're going to see uh, some interesting things about that, that Paul's writings become the word of God. And he seems to, to understand that as he's writing them, uh, writing the Corinthians. So imagine a scenario like this. I'm preaching, and, and I've got a prepared message, and something I cover in the text stirs Lyle's just bones, no pun intended. Okay, pun intended, but anyways, <laughs> it just stirs him to the root of his being that, wow, I need to say something, and Lyle makes it known to me. That he has a revelation from God that has just really burdened him. That he needs to say this. The implication is, I need to sit down. If I trust Lyle, that's a big if. No. <laughs> if I trust Lyle, and I recognize him as a prophet... Uh, you know, one in the, in the one who walks in the Spirit and speaks by the Spirit, teaches by the Spirit, and he is solid in his doctrine. I need to 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 not be too you know self whatever absorbed and recognize. Okay, whatever I thought I had to say, God's got something more important to say. And let Lyle speak. And and you know, the problem is, honestly, at Alvin Bible Church. I don't know that we've ever had that freedom, you know. I mean, maybe I would think that I would be willing to do that, but I don't know that anybody sitting in the audience felt like they could do that. So, you know, we, we kind of in our culture, we think this is the preaching time. Don't interrupt the preacher. And, and so sometimes when I ask you all questions, either you're reluctant to get it wrong or you're culturally conditioned not to speak. And I'm like, I'm trying to get past that. I want you to answer me back. I, I like that interaction uh, and stuff. But now, if Lyle has a habit of every week interrupting the sermon and saying, I got something to say, well, that's, you know, there's, oh, there's a problem there, uh, you know. Um, and, uh, and so, but the point is, God's not going to use me. How many of y'all are blessed by, or here, or, and, well, you could have watched it online, we're blessed by Tim's message last week, you know. I mean, amen. You know, God's got something to say to, to us through other men. That's why I've encouraged them to, to, you know, we don't need some outside guy to come in. We need guys in the congregation that know us to, to preach to us. And I've been trying to, to give them opportunities. And, uh, and we probably will be doing more of that on the, uh, the um, Lord's Supper days, that there may be more opportunities for Lyle and, 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 and uh, Tyler and different ones who, who the Lord's leading to, uh, to speak, you know, uh, uh, Robert or some of you other guys, Tim. Uh, there's some other guys that, that, that I think that, uh, and I'm looking over in a certain direction, no. <laughs> that have something on their heart that they should share with the church. But uh, anyways, uh, the, the point being that it's okay for God to interrupt us. In fact, you'd just be like Peter. Remember, Peter got interrupted by all three members of the Godhead every time he's speaking. You know, God interrupts him on, on the uh, Mount of Transfiguration. He's talking, and, 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 and God starts speaking. This is my beloved son, and shuts him up, you know. He's talking, and Jesus shut him up. You know, get thee behind me, Satan. He's talking, and the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and all them and interrupts him. That's a grand place to be. If the Lord interrupts me, that's, that's a privilege. And so... Uh, that's, I, I think that's what's going on in this text. I, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I think so. I think it, it, that's what it looks like. Someone who has prepared messages might be interrupted by God. Y'all okay with that? Okay. Well, notice then the, the last part. It says, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, this makes clear the point that I've already made. Uh, not everything, and maybe not most, that was spoken in the assembly was spontaneous. Uh, whatever the first prophet had to say could wait. In fact, I went to a church, and, and, and I remember the pastor being so frustrated with the music guy because he wouldn't prepare songs. He just wanted to get up there and let the spirit flow. 
And so he'd be up there at the piano going, uh, uh, what are we going to sing next? Uh, uh, well, that's not letting the spirit flow. That's just lack of preparation, you know. And, uh, you know, it's just, we, we, there's a balance for both. Now, to the moment y'all have all been waiting for. How's he going to deal with that crazy text? Let your women be silent. All right, y'all ready? This is uh, Paul's restrictions on the participation of women. Let your women, in verse 34, let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it's shameful for women to speak in church. Uh, hey, Sandra, you got any Bible studies going on? Are you going to speak? Uh, is that shameful? No. <laughs> Look, we, we, we don't just overread into this text. Read it in its context. What is Paul after? Now, I hope, I hope you track with me on this. I, I, I'm tried very hard. I know that I'm not always as clear as I could be. And I'm tried very hard to be clear about what's going on. But I want to lead you through this. I don't want to just tell you what it says, okay? It's a controversial passage. And it's complicated by the fact that in some Western manuscripts, it actually appears at the end of the passage. Uh, but it does appear in all manuscripts. So I take it as decidedly original with Paul. Some people don't, but I do. I think it's clearly Paul. And I think it was moved by some scribe to the end because of the abruptness of the transition to the topic. It just seems like to jump out of nowhere. Uh, but I think that will make sense once we analyze it, okay? Because it really doesn't jump out of nowhere. First, Paul lays out the principle. Women are to keep silent in the assembly, and in fact, are not even permitted to speak. Now, this parallels the other two groups who are to remain silent. Who are they? The, the tongue speaker that, that doesn't have the interpretation, and the prophet who needs to stand aside for someone else. They are both commanded to be silent. Now, Paul then supports this principle of women being silent in the church by an appeal to the law, that women are to be submissive. He's probably referencing Genesis 3.16. This parallels the spirit of the prophet that is subject to the prophet or submissive to the prophet. Uh, you know, that even, when the, even if Lyle feels like he, he you know, has something to say, if it's in an inappropriate moment, he, can, he doesn't have to say it. The spirit won't force you in anything. It won't force you to speak in tongues. It won't force you to prophesy. Your spirit can control your gift. And it's in, in the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, submissive. So it's the same thing here. Women are to be submissive, just like the prophet, uh, the spirit of the prophet is. So you see the connection, the parallels? Third, the women desire to learn. They want to know. And prophecy is given that all may learn. The linguistic connections are clear. So I think that, oh, in fact, even the statement that it's shameful for women to speak in the assembly ties back to Paul's previous discussion of head coverings in chapter 11. Remember what he said in chapter 11, verse 4 through 6? Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if, if it's her, as if her head were shaved. For, for if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. So there's the same shame language. So at this point, you ought to at least be thinking that this text is consistent with everything else Paul is saying in its language, in the, in the words, in the parallel concepts. So it doesn't just jump out of nowhere. It's there because it applies to what he has already said. Now to further understand this text, we need to think about the cultural context regarding women in public. Not just the biblical context, but the, uh, I mean, not just the text, you know, the, the passage context, but the, the, the cultural context. First of all, Kemp and Rosner note, in Paul's world, whether in Jewish, Greek, or Roman context, an unexplained reference to a woman's submission would normally be understood to refer to her submission to the authority of her husband. 
So, so when it just says women should be submissive, the idea is they're, that they're to be submissive to their husbands. Second, some scholars have pointed out that the Greco-Roman world, in the Greco-Roman Roman world, it was considered scandalous for a married woman to carry on a conversation with another woman's husband. So just to talk to another woman's husband was scandalous. Okay? Now, finally, and this is a little bit different, but in that culture, the women may have been treating the prophets like pagan oracles. And, and those, remember what it said? Let their, let the, if they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home. What are they trying to learn? Well, were they trying to learn things like, will my child be a boy or a girl? Or should I employ this slave or that? That's what you went to the, the pagan oracle to find out. And, and it's possible that the women were treating the prophets as pagan oracles, trying to find out all these details about things that just really were, were things that you didn't need to be asking. So let's read the text again. Every man, I'm sorry, I'm, I, let me go back and get to my notes so I don't have to find it in my Bible. Uh, let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. So uh, they're to, to, to be silent, they're, to, they're not permitted to speak, they're to be submissive, uh, they, but there's learning that, that, has, that is taking place and they want to learn, and, but yet there's a reference to the husband and shamefulness for speaking in church. Now, is there any other Bible text that might bear on this? Well, of course. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Paul, again, says, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach her to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, if you really analyze that passage, Paul's argument there seems to be squarely rooted in the created order of men and women, along with the consequences of the sin in the garden. But it's rooted in the created order. Now, notice this, though. In your English, the word silence occurs in both passages, 1 Corinthians and in 1 Timothy. But it's not the same word in the Greek. In the Greek, in 1 Timothy, it has the meaning of stillness, i.e. desistance from bustle or language, quietness or silence. For instance, it's used in 2 Thessalonians 3.12. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Now, does that mean that men and women working in the field or doing something are to work without speaking words. They're to work in silence. No, it's not utter silence. In other words, that's not even what this is about. It's talking about living your life, going about your job, earning your living without causing disturbances, without being disruptive, being quiet, peaceful, uh, you know, uh, and, and providing for yourself. So the passage obviously doesn't mean total silence. And I don't think it means total, absolute silence over in 1 Timothy. I think it means that they are to learn in a, with a quiet attitude. Notice what he says after that in 1 Timothy. That I do not allow women to teach or usurp authority over men. So the relationship of quietness and silence uh, in Timothy is in relationship to the teaching ministry of the church. It's not talking about answering a question in church. It's not talking about coming up and reading scripture. It's not talking about singing. It's not talking about any of that. It's talking about teaching men and usurping authority over men and, and learning in quietness. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, say you're in uh, uh, um, a, a Bible study, a Sunday school, and there's a, a hard theological discussion going on. And there is some back and forth. And one of the ladies in the, in the uh, Bible study begins to challenge the, the, the teacher about his doctrinal position. Uh, is that biblical? I mean, I'm talking, not asking questions, not learning. I mean, talking challenge, you know, 
What do you mean by that? Uh, well, how do you understand this verse? And how do you understand that verse? In your reading of the text, is that biblical? I don't think so in my reading of the text. I don't think that's biblical. I think that's trying to usurp and teach uh, 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 men. Now, <clears throat> hear me out. The, the word for silence in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 34, however, has a much stronger connotation of absolute silence. In fact, Paul says that women are not permitted to speak. Does he mean, then, then is he making it stronger than the Timothy thing? Is he saying women have to be quiet in church and never say a word? I don't think, I don't think so. Let's do our analysis. Are women to remain silent in church completely and absolutely? If that is the case, then how do we explain the need for a woman to wear a head covering while praying or prophesying in church as 1 Corinthians 11, 4 through 6 indicates? If, if it is permitted for women to pray and to prophesy in church as long as they're covering, uh, wearing a head covering, this doesn't apply to that. In other words, this is not a blanket statement about women being quiet in church. The context is key. Think about what Joel says. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. See, I think the answer lies in tying Paul's directive for silence back to the judging of the prophets. In other words, who is to judge? The congregation... Uh, actually, let me clarify that. The men in the congregation, I think, is what Paul is saying. That the limitation that he's putting on women is not that you can't speak up in church, that you can't do things, you can't participate, you can't sing, you can't pray, you can't prophesy. It's when it comes time to judge the, the prophet who has stood up, whether it be a man or a woman, the men are to judge. I, that's, that's what I think. I, I think that makes the most sense of the text it makes the most sense of everything that, that Paul is trying to communicate. And it fits right with the created order uh, of, of the male headship uh, of the husband. Now, it may be that the question that she's asking is of her husband, who is the prophet that's speaking. So it's kind of like if Danae is sitting back there and I say something and she says, what are you talking about? You believe that? Which is she's probably thinking that right now. Uh, but she's going to go home and, and ask me. <laughs> you know why? She didn't want to embarrass me. See, I want you to take heart, ladies. Paul's admonition may have nothing to do with you. It may have everything to do with the man. This is an honor and shame culture. And quite honestly, whether you like it or not, whether, you know, you agree or not, men can be emasculated when women approach them in the wrong way and challenge their authority or any of that kind of stuff and can really be uh, hindered. Or they will respond in an ugly, authoritarian, demeaning way. You know, who are you to talk to me that way? I can think of a, a well-known pastor uh, on YouTube, well, he's not, he's known on YouTube, but he's known everywhere, that, that saw a woman say that she left his particular brand of Christianity for a, a different brand, uh, more my brand, and, uh, and, and she just put this video out, and he responded with, who does she think she is, you know? And she didn't want to even, she, she came out of his church, but she wasn't challenging him personally, and he just had a really bad attitude about her and came across as totally demeaning. So maybe God, in his wisdom, is maybe it's not really about women so much. Maybe it's about men. His inability to handle that. I don't know. I trust God. When Paul talks about it, he says that, that, that women are not teach men because Eve was deceived. So maybe there is something about women that, that you know, is uniquely susceptible uh, to, the, to, the, to the deceptions of the devil in certain areas. But there's also things about men 
that make it necessary for God to give us regulations within the body that are not dishonoring, that are not humiliating. They just honor God when we live them out because God has made each of us to be what we are. And when we live them out in, a, in, a, in accordance with what God has said, I think we find more joy. I think we find more peace. I think we will function better. And, and I think that, that we can understand that Bad things can happen if ladies in the church begin to challenge the pastor or the speaker or the Bible teacher on, on theological issues, especially when their husband isn't present or doesn't care about that kind of stuff and they take on the battle, you know. It, it cannot be uh, the right thing. So, no, you're not to be completely, utterly silent in church. Yes, you can participate. And I welcome questions, by the way. The same way God welcomes questions, without accusation. If you can ask me, in the middle of the sermon, you are totally confused, maybe right now, <laughs> and you want to raise your hand and say, Kurt, I, I'm lost, and what I'm thinking right now doesn't, not only just doesn't make sense, I don't get it, but very dangerous for me to think like this, that you believe that or you're saying that. Can you clarify? I am totally open to that. Man or woman, I, I don't think that's prohibited from the, the text. I think it's when it's being judged as to whether or not it is a biblical revelation from God, that's when you should say, okay, guys, y'all deal with that. And if you have questions, ask uh, somebody at home, ask your, you know, your husband or another family member, or ask me and Denea privately. You know? I, does that sound reasonable to y'all? Does that sound like I'm out of whack? I, I hope I'm not. I hope I'm understanding this text correctly. It, it seems to me, when I saw it, I was like, you know, all, it just jumped out at me. Wow, he's talking about when they judge the prophets. And then I read the commentaries, and there was quite a few people that said that. I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, I'm not the only one that thinks that. So anyways, okay, so let's continue on. I, I, I think I made that clear. The whole issue is of women being silent in the church has to do with teaching men, judging men in their and their issue, not in restricting women's participation, not even keeping women from prophesying in church. So, uh, to finish up real quick, like, so we can get out of this chapter. 1 Corinthians 14, 36 through 40. Order and decency and participation. Now, Paul finishes, and I would love to get into this deeper, but I'm just going to let you let it go. Or did the word of God come originally from you, or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Now, notice Paul's dripping sarcasm. Or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? And uh, I discussed this with Danae last night. And, you know, I love this because it's a soothing balm over my conscience. <laughs> I'm being too, too sarcastic. And I said, well, Paul's sarcastic. Uh, but Danae made the comment that she probably wouldn't like Paul too much in person. So, <laughs> so and a, a, a nice, humble uh, uh, rebuke to me and my sarcasm. Uh, that cut it back, brother, cut it back. Well... Sometimes I think God uses our personality and who we are to accomplish certain things, and he certainly did that with Paul right here. He's using Paul as Paul is. But notice what he says. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, he's already said this before. If anyone thinks they have knowledge, if anyone thinks this or anyone thinks that, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. What I write to you, Paul seems to be aware that he is writing scripture, or at least that he's fully aware that the things that he are command, he's commanding are from the Lord. Maybe he didn't understand the whole letter was going to be uh, uh, divinely inspired, but he sure knew his teaching was biblical and from the Lord. And so he says, if you want to, and the Greek word is, is ignore, so you could say, but if anyone uh, ignores this, let him be ignored. Uh, 
Or you could say it as the New King James, but if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. And the idea is that if it's, if it's ignored, then let him be ignored by the church. Don't heed his, his prophecies. Don't think he's spiritual. Just ignore him. He's got nothing to say. If he does not submit to what I'm telling you, you don't have to pay any attention to him. Or it could be a veiled threat that if he ignores Paul's commandments here, which are the commandments of the Lord, God will ignore him on the day of judgment or in the day of salvation. And won't ignore him on the day of judgment, but he will ignore him on the day of salvation. So uh, it could just be uh, uh, an in-your-face. If you want to be ignorant, just be ignorant. But probably let him be ignored. You don't have to worry about somebody who will not heed God's word. You don't have to listen to them. Submit yourself under the, the, the leadership of godly men who believe God's word. And if they're not going to submit to the word of God and judge themselves, they got no business sharing it with you and trying to tell you anything because they don't submit to it. They're just using it to attack or to build their own kingdom or whatever they're trying to do. So if, if, if me or any of the elders or anybody that stands in the pulpit that wants to teach and preach, if we can't be challenged on God's word, then we don't belong up here. The prophets are judged by the church, and you should judge. You should be sitting and thinking, is that biblical? It's just how you handle it from there that makes all the difference. So order and decency in everything, Paul says. Therefore, brethren, uh, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. That's the key. Decently and in order. And then you'll avoid all this chaos. You'll avoid all this unloving attitude. You'll avoid all that nonsense when you submit yourself to the word of of God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and thank you that you have given us your word. And Lord, there's, there's more application to be done here, but Lord, I, I just feel like that this is where I need to stop and, and just, just acknowledge, God, that, that sometimes it's tough to submit to your word, especially if we misunderstand it. And then we get all riled up and angry and frustrated and uh, sometimes just discouraged and all that Lord but when we understand it and we understand you and your love and your care and concern for us and how you've designed us to be certain people you've given us certain gifts and certain capacities and certain talents and you use our personality and you want us to thrive in the faith and thriving ministering to others Lord we, then we recognize that the limitations that you put on us, whether we're a tongue speaker or a prophet, or in, in Paul's case, the women of the church, or whatever limitations you, you put on us, they're there for our good and for the, for the, whole, the good of the whole church, Lord. And we, we recognize that. And Father, we pray that you would help us just to submit ourselves, to yield ourselves, to be submissive to you and receive your word so that we can honor you, so that we can walk with you in a way that is, that is a blessing to you and a blessing to others and that does truly, truly exalt Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.